problems, the problems that you had on the problems, and uh, and and what did right. And then the other thing we'll talk about is um, is uh, we're starting chapter. Uh, we'll start ta start talking about chapter six today. So. So whenever you're ready back there, just tell me and we'll get started. All right. Well, today we're back. Uh, we've had the, our first exam already. So for you guys down at uh, down south, we'll, um, I want you to make sure you've taken the exam before you actually watch this videotape because we'll talk about the exam at the end. So that's your honor system about doing that. Now, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to finish up chapter four which was working on uh, pulse methods in electrochemistry and, and using pulse methods in electrochemistry. Actually, chapter five, I should say, not chapter four. So if I can find my space where we're at. As, we've, as you remember, we were finishing up our discussion of uh, differential pulse polarography. Can you get our notes here? Do you know how to do the twisting? OK, there we go. We got a new camera person today, so we'll see how that goes. All right, so um, differential pulse polarography. And remember the idea where we're going to take the normal pulse polarography where we just apply a, a constant pulse from a constant baseline. And in this case, the differential pulse polarography is somewhat of a different method where we take, instead of applying a constant baseline, we constantly increment the baseline by a slight amount, at the same time applying small additional pulses. So you can think about the baseline as being a way to maintain a Nernstein condition. The baseline is acting like to set the, the concentration of oxidized and reduced species as you'd expect by the Nernst equation. Uh, because it's a slow ramp up, we expect the kinetics, if the, even if the kinetics are slow, we'll still maintain a, a Nernstein behavior. Now that's not always going to be true, but that's the idea. And so the slower we go with this increment, the more likely that's going to be the case. So we have to trade off going slow to maintain the Nernstein case and going rapidly enough so that we're not wasting a lot of time doing our um, uh, waiting for the thing to equilibrate. And the little pulses on top are acting like perturbations from equilibrium. So we're applying a little pulse and that per perturbs us from equilibrium and we get our information that way. So we're doing pulses on top of that. And as you recall, we wrote the equation for the current and the current is basically a differential current where we're taking the derivative of the normal pulse polarography essentially, not quite the derivative, but close enough to the derivative to, to make that point. And we have the sort of the normal pulse sort of setup here, where then at underneath we have T minus tau minus tau prime to the one half power. And we're multiplying by this set of values, one minus sigma over one plus sigma where sigma is equal to an exponential function of the uh, potential pulse height. Okay. So this quotient here is kind of a, a parameter that we can adjust. Uh, T minus tau is where we're, we're making our measurement. Remember, we're going to measure, there would be tau prime and this would be tau on our system. So we're just going to be measuring the, the, that, that pulse width is basically this, this term here. Okay. Now when delta E becomes large, the quotient approaches one and the signal becomes larger and larger, but 
we, re we lose resolution on our peak. Our peak becomes wi wider and wider. It turns out that that peak is, for the delta I max, is the width is proportional to the delta E, as you recall. So not only do we, lose, we make the, the peak broader, but we also shift it away from the E one half. In other words, as you make that E pulse height bigger and bigger, where we lose resolution, we get increased sensitivity. So again, it's a trade-off between resolution and sensitivity. So if we've got more than one analyte in the system, we may start to mix the peaks together and we would lose the ability to separate the, 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 those components. So usually delta E is a compromise uh, approximately 50 millivolts. And again, this is mainly an analytical method, so we're not really interested whether or not the E1 half is exactly on the E0 and so on and so forth. With this method, we can increase the resolution and the sensitivity from the normal pulse polarography method to about 10 to the minus 8th molar, which is pretty good. Uh, basically, the main advantage of the differential pulse polarography is besides getting a, a more conveniently measured analytical signal, usually peaks are easier to measure than uh, you know, a, a sigmoid, it's hard to say, well, where's that, where do you measure that sigmoid, especially if the sigmoid has got a sloping baseline. As often happens with very low concentration measurements, you're getting not a nice sigmoid like this, but you're getting perhaps a signal that looks maybe like that, where you've got underlying it a, a baseline that's a, it's a, it's a straight line. In fact, that's a, that'd be the ideal case, often that, Back, background is not a straight line, it's sloped and so on. So typically in a normal pulse polarography experiment like this, what we can usually get is an improvement in the signal by taking, the, by doing this derivative method, differential pulse method, and you get a signal that would be something like this on top of it, some sort of a Gaussian like that on top. And that would be a little bit easier to measure. Usually it reduces the background by somewhat and it also uh, increases the um, ability to measure that peak height. Now we show differential pulse polarography like so with this uh, set of staircases up and, and back. The original implementation of the method was using, and it, the reason they doing it this way is this works really with, good with computers because we can step the pulse up and down with the computer control. Uh, between whatever potentials we've got, but originally it was developed using sort of analog electronics and it was easier to make a scan that would be something like this. Where we have a baseline that instead of staying constant would slow, slowly slope up and this would be similar to what we're going to see in a minute with a scanning uh, cyclic voltammogram or something where we have a baseline that increases on this axis. And this also is called differential pulse voltammetry or polarogram. And the theory is essentially the same uh, for the two methods. So essentially what you can see here is this is a linear sweep and then we're applying a set of equal size potential steps on top of it. So you just have to sum those two sources together. Uh, not, not a big difference, but uh, as sometimes happens, there's sort of a religious problem with those. People think one way is better than the other way, and so they're, they uh, have kind of wars about that occasionally. Quiet conflicts, really, more than wars. But um, you will see both of them, and sometimes people will vehemently disagree that that is differential pulse polarography. Uh, some other types that we won't really get into, and I'll refer to the literature because most of these, are, again, are useful mostly for analysis and, and once you've developed the method, there are different uh, advantages and disadvantages and that would have to do with the specific analysis that you're doing. One type that's very popular though is called Oster-Young square wave voltammetry. And the team of Janet Oster-Young and Robert Oster-Young, uh, two chemists, they were, they were at various different places. Uh, when they did most of the work on square wave voltammetry at the University of Buffalo, Sunny Buffalo. And uh, they really were very interested in applying computers to electrochemistry and so they came up with a lot of methods that exploited computers and so they used them to 
develop new pulse-based methods and a, really a useful method is Ostrian square wave altimetry where the pulses look somewhat like this where they have very high pulses and then back to an, a, a low baseline. <laughs> yep. And so on. The advantage of these is that you get, um, well, what you do is you measure at different points. For example, you would measure here, and that would be the forward current sample. And you would measure here. And there would be a uh, two parameter, two other parameters that you would set. One would be here would be T pulse, and the other parameter would be a tau parameter, which would be the width of this entire cycle, and so on. And then there would be sort of this increment um, of potential each time called E S W. So that would be I F. That would be I sub R. And typically, e, delta ES is um, about 10 millivolts. Delta ES is this uh, little bit here. And ESW, about 50 millivolts. The advantage of the Austrian square of voltammetry mainly arrives in the fact that tau can be quite fast. Because we don't have to wait for the equilibration like we did with the differential pulse polarography, we can, we can go much faster. Uh, from less than one milliseconds to, you know, 100 milliseconds would be not an atypical value. Uh, what you get out of the Austrian or OS, OSWV voltammetry is something like this, which you, you get a curve for the forward wave that looks a little bit like this, and then the reverse wave looks uh, somewhat like that. And the sum of those two waves is a Gaussian, which is really what you, you normally look at. So I have my, actually the, the subtraction of the two. And the advantage is it gets fast and actually has better sensitivity than the other methods. And it's a complicated pulse, potential pulse waveform, but with computers it's no big deal to do this. And so um, it works pretty nicely. Again, useful for analysis. There's a variant of this called Barker square wave voltammetry, very similar in other ways. That also has some advantages. Uh, again, uh, if you look in a, in analytical chemistry book, they'll talk about some of these. The other major one, and we'll finish with this, is, and we'll have probably some opportunities to discuss more clearly the advantages and disadvantages of some methods later on when we've seen all the possibilities. But here's a wave, one called staircase voltammetry. It's not really a pulse method. Uh, it's actually, but it is a kind of a discrete method where we, instead of applying a a wave that's a constant linear function we actually apply it in a series of, of steps, hence the name staircase. So you would have ET here where again you'd have a tau which would be the staircase width and you would have a, a potential step delta E. And if you plot delta, or you, if you make if you take the ratio of delta E over tau, that's a, essentially a scan rate, and that would be in volts per second, uh, typically. And what we'll see just in a minute is this is very similar to what we're going to talk about later with linear sweep voltammetry, where the analog would be, rather than a, a set of staircases, we have a straight line where we change the potential continuously with time. 
Now most modern instruments actually somewhat unfortunately have this square wave voltammetry is what they're saying is a cyclic or a linear sweep. So they try to make delta E and tau very small, but essentially what you're getting is still a staircase voltammetry outlet output. And it turns out that there, there is good correspondence for certain kinds of conditions, but in many cases, staircase and cyclic voltammetry are not comparable. They don't give you the same results, particularly for uh, kinetic measurements and things where you're doing physical electrochemistry. They're very different. For analytical methods, they're almost identical. In fact, the staircase voltammetry may have some advantages for analytical purposes, but uh, for other reasons, it's not so great. Um, for when, when the instruments are trying to make a, a linear sweep out of a staircase, they can do a couple things. One is that you can use very small uh, steps so that you get very small steps like this. And also they can run it through a low pass filter so that that essentially smooths out the steps and you get a, a more approximately a linear sweep. I would recommend a very good introduction to this uh, written by Janet Osterjung and one of her postdocs at the time, I think a student and then a postdoc, John O'Day. Uh, there's a set of books, Electroanalytical Chemistry, there's a set of collection of monographs, volume 14, uh, as Bard is the editor. And uh, this about staircase voltammetry, square wave voltammetry, very good, very complete discussion of the methods. And so we'll pretty much stop there and uh, go on. All right.